So our last presentation for today is um, by Jeremy, and he's going to be talking about uh, stock assessment issues in southeastern Australia. Um, now, I'm aware that um, I'm standing between Andre and Beer, so um, my plan is probably to go through some of this a little bit quickly. If you've got questions, I'm very happy to take them uh, over a drink, um, or we want, if you want more details. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, fisheries in Australia. I'm just going to turn this screen around so I can see what you can see. Um, so this is just an overview slide of the sorts of fisheries that uh, there are in Australia, most of which I'll be talking about will be the um, scale fish fisheries on the shelf and the slope, um, a little bit on uh, Patagonian toothfish, but there are a range of other fisheries there as well. Um, and this plot here, I really just want to show that, that uh, the, the maroon colour red down the bottom there, uh, which is the CSF fisheries, and the, the trend there is basically towards getting uh, less and less value of fisheries caught over time. So the story there is there's less money for uh, assessment and research. Um, some of the other fisheries are going up a bit, but certainly the, the maroon and the red is going down. Uh, so the CSF is a southeast, uh, south, southern and eastern scale fish and shark fishery. Um, you can probably read most of that. Uh, the, the key points is it takes up uh, almost half the Australian fishing zone. Um, there are about 34 different species and there's about 13 of those that are assessed at a tier one level, which is a, a, a data rich level rather than a data poor level and there's limited money. Um, so uh, I guess the other thing to say is I'm talking about the production side rather than the development side of assessment models. Um, and so we're tuning out these assessments for a, a, um, a relatively large number of species. Um, here's a, a quick map showing you the area. Um, so that area is well south of Japan and it's um, west of New Zealand if you don't know where it is. Um, it's the southern and eastern part of Australia and there's, you can see Macquarie Island uh, down on the, the right hand corner here where the Patagonian toothfish is caught. Um, and in my time uh, working in the CSF fisheries I've seen a number of different platforms used. Um, in recent times we've moved away from a lot of those uh, other platforms to the one in bold there which is stock synthesis. Um, not all of the fisheries in the CSF are uh, assessed using stock synthesis, in particular the shark fisheries. Um, well, someone, a lot of them, actually all of them were assessed in Fortran in the old days by um, uh, someone who's wanting beer, I think, soon. Uh, but uh, since he left uh, Syrah, we've uh, moved on to other platforms that are a bit more advanced. Um, so we use stock synthesis now for a lot of those species. As I said, not all of them. If you want to know about sharks, talk to Robin Thompson, who'll be talking uh, later on in this uh, workshop. Um, there are other species that uh, we have used stock synthesis for and we've moved away from it in particular, and I'll mention that perhaps a bit later too, Patagonian toothfish, where we did use synthesis for many years, but we've just moved to a TMB model. So. Uh, but for a number of species, and maybe 10 or 11 or 12, it's been really successful for us. Um, and as a group, the CSF stock assessment team moved to stock synthesis in about 2006, where we had a visit from um, Rick Mathot, actually, who came and showed us how to use stock synthesis. And it coincided nicely with the uh, introduction of a, of a new uh, harvest policy in 2007. Um, Synthesis has also been used in a couple of other places in Australia, as you've seen already today in Queensland, but also in South Australia um, with sardines. Uh, and I believe it's going to be used for coral trout in Queensland soon. Um, so back to the CSF. Um, I guess the main point of this slide really was that uh, Prior to 2007, when the new Commonwealth Harvest Strategy Policy came in, uh, the rules were uh, somewhat ad hoc in terms of uh, dealing with the assessment results and turning them into management outcomes. 
So with the introduction of a, of a harvest strategy policy, those rules became a bit more clear cut. Um, and I think you can read the rest of that slide yourself and I'll move on. Um, so for uh, our CSF species, we've got a, a tier based um, system of harvest control rules. Uh, where we calculate RBCs, you can think of those as ABCs if you like, recommended biological catch, it's the, uh, the, the catches that get passed to management for sending the quotas. Um, and we've got a, a range of different tier levels. Uh, so for the, the data richer species, we use, um, uh, uh, basically the species we, where we use uh, uh, stock synthesis to, to assess, them, assess the uh, uh, the species, those are the robust quantitative assessments and there are a range of other assessments as well which I'm not going to talk about further today. Um, one of the things that we have done with our assessment processes is we've gone through a, an, an MSE testing of the harvest control rules. So the harvest control rules uh, are relatively recent. We wanted to make sure that the advice we were giving um, actually uh, worked. So we developed um, Synthesis-like MSE, the, uh, um, the operating model was more or less based on synthesis uh, and that was developed largely initially by Gavin Fay um, and others as well and we use stock synthesis as the assessment model in that MSE um, and uh, I guess the, the major point I want to make with this slide really is that the important point here is to get our MSC to work is we required uh, our harvest control rule to be coded into stock synthesis. Um, and I, I guess that's, if there's anything that, that I want you to take out of this talk, it's probably that point. Um, that, that's been really important for us to have our uh, Australian harvest control rule, which is uh, different to a harvest control use, rules used elsewhere to be incorporated to the software. And we were uh, fortunate, I guess, to be able to to have that uh, incorporated by the developers of the software. Um, I think that's important, not just for us, but probably for other places where there are harvest control rules that might be different to uh, the, the standard harvest control rules that might be incorporated into software. Um, so there's a quick view of our harvest control rule. It's an F-based harvest control rule. Um, we've got a, a, a target and a limit and a break point. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that if you want to over beer. Um, and I just want to give a rough overview of the range and names of, and types of species that have been assessed. Um, so I've put species in bold there just to give you a, uh, an indication there's a, a relatively large number of tier ones. I haven't been involved in assessing all of those, but I've been involved in a lot of those. Um, and I guess I wanted to highlight some of the uh, more interesting or unusual features that we've required for our assessments. And we've been lucky to, uh, to have some of those features uh, incorporated into stock synthesis and I think in some cases those features have been incorporated largely because we've requested them. I mean maybe I can be corrected on that but things like um, cohort dependent growth for uh, what you might call hokey or we call blue grenadier I think that's probably the only species that's incorporated that in, in stock synthesis. Um, we have uh, some uh, productivity shift that's incorporated into our jackass mormon assessment uh, which required a bit of uh, extra coding a couple of years ago when uh, uh, stock synthesis moved to version 3.30 to make our control rule work um, and uh, some issues we've got also with uh, spatial assessments and tagging which have been perhaps not quite so successful uh, patagonian toothfish for instance there was a model where we adapted the tagging structure that has been adopted in synthesis and I tried to run that this year uh, and it ran for about six weeks and the MCMC still didn't converge. Um, so fortunately we had a backup plan there and Rich Hillary developed the TMB model uh, and uh, we've switched from the SS model to the TMB model. Um, it did in about 80 minutes rather than the six weeks when the, the SS one didn't converge. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a bit more persistent than you, Rick. But <laughs> fortunately, I had uh, Rich as a backup. Um, so to talk about some of the features that uh, we want in a, in a package and that, that I guess a lot of these 
uh, come through for us with stocks emphasis in the CSF at least. Uh, the first thing there is the harvest control rule incorporated into the software. That's pretty important for us. Um, things like productivity shifts, cohort dependent growth I've already talked about. Uh, one of the issues that we do deal with reasonably often these days um, is uh, low recruitment uh, projections and that seems to be an increasing trend where we seem to have a change in the productivity and we've dealt with that with a, uh, not completely ad hoc but we've kind of had a bit of a work around to uh, to deal with that with, with stock sensors, it's not quite as ideal or as perfect as we'd like it to be, but we've, we've got a solution that will work for us. Um, the standard diagnostics that we get from uh, stock synthesis, I think it's already been mentioned a couple of times today, but um, R4SS is, is fantastic. I'll echo those sentiments. It, it makes our, the preparation of our stock assessment so much easier and the support that we get from people like um, Ian Taylor sitting in the back there has been fantastic. Um, Data weighting functionality, uh, it's, it's really useful to have the functionality that comes through R4SS and SS, I guess, uh, to get our data weighting uh, well either right or getting closer to being right. I know that's an evolving science. Um, and support from a number of people, uh, many of whom are in this room uh, over a number of years uh, to get uh, our SS assessments in Australia going has been very um, useful. Um, what about features design? And this is getting close to my last slide, I think. Um, I guess I just want to flag a few things for the future. We've got a project that's just starting looking at multi-species uh, harvest control rules. Um, and uh, we, want if, we want to consider using uh, potentially both technical and trophic interactions in that project. And that's a bit of a challenge, I think, that's coming up. Um, there are a few issues with tagging uh, that we would like to have uh, incorporated a little better, I think. Um, and I guess those apply both to Patagonian toothfish and to some work that uh, one of my colleagues who's not here, Dale, has used in the Indian Ocean. Um, there are a couple of other points that Dale provided for me that I think you can just read because I know that B is coming up pretty soon. Um, Ability to incorporate harvest control rules. I guess I just want to highlight that that's something that was, has been discussed in a couple of trips I've had in recent years, uh, one to Chile and one to, to Queensland, where in that case, uh, in both jurisdictions, they didn't actually have harvest control rules yet, but when they had them, they'd like to be able to include them in the software. Um, and the other ability we'd like to have in a, a future software platform, and I'm sure Robin will talk more about this uh, later in the week, is close kin. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, we have lots of time, so qu time for questions. Um, Yeah, thanks for this. Uh, it's pretty cool to see that list. Um, thanks a lot, Dale, for all the questions. <laughs> uh, with regard, the third one from the bottom, um, I think that is now going to be possible that because in the forecast no longer needs to depend upon some average of past conditions. Essentially, things that are defined as a random effect can continue as a random effect into the forecast. So in principle, we should be able to uh, sample from that with the variance. We should be able to get the variance in the annual selectivity parameters into the forecast. So I'll be able to pass that on to Dale and say in principle we can do some of that. Is that correct? I might um, direct him to you to ask for more details. I can hear some questioning coming from Andre there on the left. I think what we were after, now I'm changing my title to Syra for a couple of seconds, <laughs> uh, is, is full feedback. So the ability to call stock synthesis from stock synthesis to be able to do full feedback control rather than just more sophisticated forecasts. I think that would be what we would be after. Um, yeah, I think that's right. That's a, that's a pretty hard step. Well, that'll be Nathan's part, really. <laughs> oh, okay. It's coming or it will come or it's there. 
It's coming. Well, in fact, the future is by definition coming, but there you go. Yeah, John. Uh, yeah, sorry, I wasn't quite clear if you're using stock synthesis as the sort of assessment that drives the harvest control rule or as the basis for the operating model in an MSC or both? We're doing both. Uh, so we uh, use stock synthesis, well, at least in the CSF, we've got an MSC that's written uh, to test our harvest control rules. So uh, running that MSC gave uh, management confidence that we could use uh, stock synthesis and, and those harvest control rules rather uh, to manage the fishery. But then to do the assessments, we used uh, stock synthesis to, to, and we have the harvest control rule built into stock synthesis to give us uh, our RBCs. Uh, I think um, in the Indian Ocean, Dale does slightly different things. They're using stock synthesis to condition models. But I think Simon Hoyle probably is in a much better position to talk to you about that if you want to know more details. But certainly in the, CES, in the CSF, we use it for for uh, producing RBCs. Thanks, I, ha I had a quick second question. Uh, across all of these different species, are you doing like separate um, harvest control rules for each species? And if so, how do you manage to make these things compatible in a multi-species fishery? <laughs> Uh, we don't have separate calves control rules for each species. To answer the first part of the question, I might come back to the second part in a minute and ask you to, to clarify. Uh, so, well, we have a, a tier-based harvest control rule where we've got uh, uh, different tiers with different levels of, uh, of data going into the model. All, those, well, all of the species that were highlighted, I think, on my list were tier one species. Um, so they're uh, data rich species, supposedly. Um, they use all the same harvest control rules. Sometimes the, uh, the target reference points can change from species to species, um, but it's the same form of the harvest control rule for all of those species. And the second part of the question again? I, I guess it, it was, you know, if you have um, a, a bunch of uh, TACs, yeah. um, how, how do these actually work operationally in a multi-species? So this is, um, I, I think, the question that's going to be answered by the project that um, hasn't yet been finished, and it's going to be a big challenge, the, um, the multi-species species harvest control rule that uh, Rich Little is working on. Um, and I, I think that's a big challenge. I mean, essentially, some of your uh, catches of, of some species will be limited by uh, the TACs being caught by other species, and it's looking at the effects of that, and, and there's a big project that's being worked on right now that's going to solve all the problems of the world, I believe. Isn't that right, Andre? You're involved in that. Uh, yeah, but I, I don't get paid enough to solve the problems here at work. Uh, just back on that point, most of the, there's only really three or four species in the fishery that drive the whole thing. All the others are undercaught quite substantially in some cases, yeah. particularly given there's been a quite substantial buyback or loss of vessels. And so essentially the, the fleet sort of compacted down to uh, about four, four species that, that they target on, on and all the rest are sort of bycatch and byproduct. And we have a bit of a problem with uh, non-recovering species too that uh, in theory are supposed to recover and, and, and don't seem to be recovering. So uh, that's a, a big problem too for our fishery. Uh, okay, any other questions? Yeah. yeah, just uh, one question. I was curious in terms of just your experience in your um, jurisdiction, like how much of a push is there to um, get more and more stocks having model-based assessments versus um, lower level sort of possibly empirical assessments? Um, I think in the, the Commonwealth, the, uh, there's... There hasn't been much increase in the number of, of stocks that are being assessed uh, in recent years. Um, uh, the number of species, uh, so I guess we're, they're getting pushed up in the, the lower tier levels. The number of tier one stocks is pretty uh, constant, or has been over time. There hasn't been an increase in the number of tier ones. There have been increases in numbers of tier fours and fives that are being assessed. Um, but to get to have good data for the data rich stocks we've basically got tier one assessments for most of those already there are a couple that are kind of hanging on the edge that we've tried to get tier ones for and they've kind of fallen over um, or haven't quite got over the bar and some of those have slipped down to in some cases tier three four and five although 
strictly speaking, our tier two and three have uh, self-destructed recently too, so we don't have those anymore. So if it's not a tier one, it's a tier four. I think we've got a tier six and a seven as well. Yeah, it's kind of, an, yeah, it is a bit Monty Python. No, they, well, they're here, yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. Yeah, hi, Jeremy. Um, oh, sorry, Jimmery. Um, I was interested in Jackass Morlong. You mentioned uh, low productivity, uh, productivity change. And um, if I, like, my recollection was there was a change in 2008 or, or around about there and... 1988 is where we've incorporated the productivity shift for Jackass Morlong, yes. Okay. And how do you incorporate this productivity shift? My recollection was it was a change in the unfished biomass. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, B0 or R0. Um, and, and what that meant was that the fish was no longer overfished. And so there was an increase in the TAC. No longer classified as overfished. Yeah, there was an increase in the TAC from zero to um, not very much. Uh, it was a decrease in the long-term RBC though. Yeah. Um, does that answer? All of your questions or have you gotten another part to the question i'm happy to keep to let you keep going you know i was just wondering like whether whether you thought that was the appropriate way to handle the yeah, change in productivity it's a really good question i think um uh, at the time industry were very very excited about it because they faced the prospect of the fishery being closed and there being uh, effects on other species as well because of bycatch issues um uh, one of the questions I actually are, I wonder too with that species in particular is whether, so we've modeled that essentially as a step function in the productivity change. So it's gone from one productivity and it's just jumped, dropped off a cliff to another one. And I, I suspect there's a, a better way to model that. It looks like if you look at the recruitment deviations, it looks like there are more patterns there and there may be a, a further decline in that productivity. Um, the other thing that to say about that species is that productivity shift was uh, built in due to some work from Sally Waite where she looked at, I don't know how familiar you are with that, where she looked at the offshore pelagic phase of that species and changes to the Eastern Australian current. So there was a, a physical link to the productivity shift. Um, there's probably plenty of room for debate about whether that's the right thing to do or not, but um, it's what's been, effect what's been accepted by management and by the uh, the RAG, the Resource Assessment Group that manages that species, and it's uh, it's where we are. Interestingly enough, there's a western stock and an eastern stock of Jackass Morwong in Australia, and the western stock has no recruitment shift, but the western stock is not affected by the eastern Australian current in that case. Okay, any more questions, or do you want to go and get beer? <laughs> Jim. <laughs> Mark Chambers asked such a hard question. I, I want to know if you can say CSIRO, CESF, assessments, and SS five times really fast. No, no, I can't. Maybe after a few beers. Okay, um, so. So um, that's it.